Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us uh, here with uh, the American Battlefield Trust Gettysburg 158 coverage where as you see in the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg on Cemetery Hill, I'm Gary Edelman, that's Chris White behind the camera. Uh, we have already shot videos all over the battlefield and you've already heard about the fighting um, at uh, Cemetery Hill, of course, um, you know, that we posted a couple of days ago. But now we're really going to focus on, of course, you know, the, the worst part of war, you know, the heartbreak and uh, the human loss. And this is a cemetery, uh, you know, for Union soldiers. We might uh, show you an exception to that rule as we go along here. And we're going to visit, you know, some of uh, those buried here in this cemetery, some of whom we've talked about on our previous videos. Now, this is called Cemetery Hill before the battle because there is an adjacent cemetery. You might be able to see it over my shoulder, Evergreen Cemetery that opened about eight years before the battle. Um, and then after the battle, it seemed like this was a good place to bury the dead uh, in some organized fashion. This is a new thought. It is not like battles before Gettysburg where you know people and states and governments got together and said, let us think about how we're going to bury somebody on this bear battleground. And therefore, this is the first national cemetery on a major battlefield. There had been a few national cemeteries at other Civil War places, hospitals and whatnot around Washington, but this is the first one on a major battlefield. And it's pretty well known, of course, it's going to be consecrated through extensive events on November 19th, 1863 by Abraham Lincoln and Edward Everett and others, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, so with that, uh, we're gonna introduce our first guest here. Um, this is Doug Dowds. Uh, uh, U.S. Army War College Licensed Battlefield Guide at Gettysburg. You know it. Good afternoon, gang. So one of the questions often gets to be is, do they still find relics or remains or anything out on this battlefield? And of course the answer is yes. They find things all the time, uh, whether it's a dig up on Culp's Hill or doing some architecture around the battlefield. Now, one of the last set of remains found, we actually talked about while we were out at the railroad cut. On the first day's fight, we talked about the 6th Wisconsin will charge into the railroad cut, lose one man for every yard that they advance across that field. They'll go to hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the second Mississippi and then send those men from Joseph Davis's brigade retreating back across the field. Now the last set of remains to be found on this field we found in 1996 in that railroad cut. Now of course because they had been hand-to-hand -hand fighting with both Union and Confederate soldiers there they didn't know whether it was a Union or a Confederate so what they do is they invite the oldest living and uh, Union and oldest living Confederate widow. They invite uh, Alberta Johnson and Daisy Martin. Daisy Martin was married to a member of the 4th Alabama that would fight down on Little Round Top. And Daisy Johnson, well, she would be married to a member of the U.S. Colored Troops that would make up fully 10% of the Union Army by the time the war is done. Now, they would both come to Gettysburg in 1997. In fact, they would go and have breakfast on the morning of the ceremony. And when it was all over, they said they would get along famously. And then they would come out here to the cemetery and they would bury that set of the remains right here the last Civil War soldier to be buried here at Gettysburg. And as we talked about, we don't know whether that soldier whistled, whistled Dixie or sang John Brown's body. One thing we're certain of is that the soldier was not married to either one of these two women. But as Gary mentioned, for all of those soldiers, and you, we should, you know, why would they invite those, those widows here? Um, although unrelated to this veteran, I think we knew that there is some purpose behind that. I think they got to represent every woman, every mother, every wife, every sister that didn't have the opportunity to bury their husband, brother, or son. And so they came here, and here that soldier is buried as an American, as an American citizen whose blood ran red in the fighting of this war. Why don't we walk over this way? Now, there are a lot of other soldiers here. We talked out at the annex that there are some 7,000 other soldiers buried here from other wars, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, and even Vietnam before this cemetery finally closes. There are two Medal of Honor winners that are buried in this cemetery, one of whom is this man right here. This is William Miller, member of the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry. If you know anything about the Army of the Potomac Cavalry, you know that they get the worst end of the stick on most of these parts. Uh, he joins the uh, 3rd PA Cav, uh, fights with them for most of the war. Uh, he's at Brandy Station on the 9th of June. He fights at Aldi, he fights at Upperburg, uh, and ultimately he would be out on the East Cavalry Field on July 3rd. And of course, we have a picture of Captain William Miller in his prime. 
This is what he looked at as a company commander. He would be out there on the July 3rd fight taking place out on that cavalry field. And just like we've talked about, those cavalry battles are often a chess match to begin with. Each side making its initial moves out on that battlefield. And finally, Jeb Stewart would launch his coup de main, a large column of cavalry marching across the field. Most of the time we know the story of George Armstrong Custer riding with a regiment of cavalry and he would slam into the front of that column. Well, it just so happened that William Miller was responsible for four companies over on the Low Dutch Road. And as he sees this column goes by, he turns to one of his lieutenants and utters something that's probably been uttered on many a battlefield throughout time. He turns to his lieutenant and says, Lieutenant, at my court martial, tell them that this was a good idea because his orders were to hold the low Dutch road and not to leave it. And ultimately what he would do is charge out with those four squadrons of cavalry. They would sever the back one third of that column and talking across the field. As they were being slammed into the front, Confederates in that column would look back behind them and see that their route of retreat was covered. And of course that field ends up being a bit of a push. The Confederates don't get around, the Union hold the field. William Miller will continue to serve with the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry. And it's not till years later. In fact, after he gets out of the Army, goes up to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, opens up a hardware store. He's such an upstanding individual, he'll be uh, elected to be a congressman to the state of Pennsylvania. And it won't be until 1897 that finally somebody looks back and goes, hey, you know what was the difference out on that battlefield? William Miller and his charge. And with that, they will finally award him his Medal of Honor for those actions that he took on that day. One of the few Medals of Honor ever won for disobeying an order. Let's walk up this way. And that's great, Doug. Some of you might remember that uh, we visited uh, East Cavalry Field uh, uh, yesterday or the day before, and uh, we talked about William Miller. So if you haven't watched that video, go back and see uh, Jim Hessler and da Dan Davis actually talking about this. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're walking through the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg. And if you look at William Miller, you know, you would note that he has an upright uh, headstone, okay, as opposed to the flat graves that you see over here. Why? Well, let's talk about this for a second. Because on, uh, you know, it was right immediately after the battle, uh, local people in Gettysburg realized there was a problem. There were dead soldiers buried wherever they fell all over the battlefield. Arguably, it was a health risk and whatnot. So the governor of Pennsylvania um, and other concerned citizens here got together and started this idea of making a cemetery. This cemetery will take shape and they will decide on the location next to the existing town cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery. They're going to work with a very respected landscape architect named William Saunders, and Saunders will come up with a, a strange, well, there is a strange shape of land in the first place, and then he'll come up with sort of a design that'll go around a central monument, uh, you know, and, and then they asked the states to help, and the states got involved, Doug. Yeah, so what they do is when uh, Governor Curtin here, he talks to one of the local attorneys to contact the other 17 Union governors who had troops here, and they all agree that they do want to do something. That same attorney finds this ground and hires William Saunders to design this and you can see he designs this in a semi-circular design always around a central object. Now at first it was supposed to be by unit. First Corps men, second Corps men. State of Massachusetts steps in and says no no we want our men buried with Massachusetts men. This is also part of the design. What it's going to be now is 18 sections for each Union state that's here. One section for the U.S. regulars and of course uh, three sections for the unknown. And all we've done is come over here to the Pennsylvania section. Now, in this, ultimately, when we put this all together, we'll have 3,512 Union dead, 1,674 of whom are unknown. And we were just talking about unknowns and unknown unknowns. If we opened up a grave and we saw that perhaps nothing I identify you individually, but we'd see a Pennsylvania belt buckle, well, then you were an unknown, but we could put you in the Pennsylvania section. If we found nothing, then we couldn't identify you, but we knew you were a Union soldier. You were an unknown unknown, 979 of them. Where I'm standing, you can see some unknown Zouaves. Now, one of the areas that we visited earlier in one of our former videos was out at the Peach Orchard. And one of the 114th Pennsylvania was known as the Collis Zouaves. Here they are in their colorful uniforms. Of course, at one point in the war, they had been raised and commanded by Charles Collis. Charles Collis was a wonderful commander. He would actually be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at Fredericksburg. Unfortunately for them, he was wounded at Chancellorsville two months before the Battle of Gettysburg. So he's not here. 
Now, ultimately what's gonna happen is the 114th Pennsylvania will fight out in the Sherfy barn. When Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade covers that 500 yards in just under five minutes and slams into the Sherfy house and barn, many of the wounded from the 114th Pennsylvania would climb into the Sherfy barn. The Sherfy barn hit by shells would later on catch on fire and burn to the ground with many of the wounded in there. Now, we said that there are two Medal of Honor winners buried there and we met William Miller already. The second is Charles Collis. He would go on after the war uh, to grow on to be much fame and he would also uh, become very wealthy. And truth be told, he could have lived anywhere and been buried anywhere. What he does is he comes back to Gettysburg and builds a home over on uh, West Confederate Avenue, what we know as Red Patch today. Now, many people say as they look at Charles Collis's grave that forever he looks back over his home over on uh, West Confederate Avenue. I would argue not only is he looking at his old home, I would argue that forever for the rest of his days, he will now look over those unknown Zouaves that he was unable to take care of on July 2nd, 1863. That's, that's a very poignant thought, Doug. I, I never thought about that before. Um, you know, now you also notice while we're walking around, you can see flags on all of the 3,512 graves in this cemetery, as well as the nearly 4,000 additional graves in the cemetery annex. This is not year round. This is because this is the Gettysburg anniversary and some, you know, civic minded people who care about our history actually place these flags and then pull them up after Independence Day every year, year after year. And I think we're going to go over this way. Please watch uh, uh, the headstones there. Um, I'm going to bring on our friend Anne from Ancestry, family historian at Ancestry Fold 3, um, as we walk over to the next section. But let me just show you one thing. Uh, Doug mentioned that the states were going to be, you know, uh, buried together. So here we have it. Pennsylvania, 534 bodies, of which, you know, probably a third are those partly unknowns. They might know a first name and a state, but that doesn't help us, you know, to identify the person, especially lacking the records they had. We've actually been able to do work um, over the years to identify some of the unknowns or partly unknown in the cemetery. Now, Anne, uh, come on, uh, you're a family historian with Ancestry Fold 3. We've had a great partnership this whole time, and I think this kind of brings full circle um, some of the stories we've been telling. So why are we coming right here, Anne? This is the grave of Edward Heath. He, unlike some of the other graves we've seen, didn't win a Medal of Honor. Nobody's written a book about him. He actually has no descendants, but I think he may be more representative of the many thousands of bodies that are buried here. When he died, he left broken hearts. He was the son of Consider Heath. That was his father, one of those great historical names. He was born in Racine, Wisconsin. At the age of 17, he enlisted. He was the only son in the household. There were two daughters and the one son. He joins the second Wisconsin. He does his duty and then he comes to Gettysburg. It says here, well, our documents tell us that he died on July 4th, but he wasn't in a battle, I believe, on July 4th because he was part of the second Wisconsin. And nobody seems to ha quite have that dated together. I'm gonna ask our Civil War historians to help us put that together here in a minute, but here's what I want to tell you. There's this saying in family history, and I forget who says it. We live as long as someone says our name. Edward H. Heath had no descendants. No one researches him and puts him in the family tree, except the very dedicated, those who know that you can't just do, see how far you can go back. You have to tell the stories of the brothers and the sisters and everyone in your family, because if we don't research this 18 year old boy who left no one behind but broken hearted mother and father and sisters, no one will speak his name. No one will tell his story. No one will tell how he sacrificed his life to preserve our country. And these are the stories we need to tell and this is what we need to remember when we're at solemn places like the National Gettysburg Cemetery. So can one of you help me and tell me when Edward Heath might have died? 
and we know he died from wounds. First of all, let me say, Anna, that well put, and this is all of our jobs. This is what we have to do, um, you know, to perpetuate our own history. And if we lose our history, we're, we're nowhere as a country over time. Um, what I can tell you, I don't know if we can solve any mysteries, but we're in the Wisconsin plot. He's in the second Wisconsin. The second Wisconsin was most active on July 1st, 1863, fighting in McPherson's or Reynolds or Herbst Woods, okay? This is where uh, the Iron Brigade fought. They are in the Iron Brigade. This is where the famous John Burns fought, became the hero of Gettysburg fighting next to um, these units here and although the 2nd Wisconsin took up a position on Culp's Hill afterward you can visit a marker over there you can see their trenches actually over there they really didn't do any more fighting in the battle uh, correct me if I'm wrong so I'm gonna go ahead and speculate uh, inform speculation that uh, you know, Edward Heath would have been mortally wounded uh, on July 1st in the terrible fighting on the first day's battlefield. It could have been on Seminary Ridge or in McPherson's Woods, and then he was probably brought to a, a hospital, maybe the Seminary Hospital, where he would expire two, three days after he fought. Breaking his family's heart. Yes, indeed. We need to remember him. Good, thanks. Doug? So, if we think about it, that's just one of nearly 7,000 men who would die in this battle, and then nearly another 4,000 would die in the week after. Although Lee would take 7,000 of his wounded in a wagon train 17 miles long, there would be over 20,000 wounded in the town. And then the second great invasion of Gettysburg happened. The do-gooders show up. The Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission and doctors and nurses from Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington to help relieve the suffering of all the wounded at 175 hospitals. Uh, every public building, barn, and church becomes a hospital. Once you are stable enough, we would move you to Camp Letterman, the largest field hospital in North America. Once you were stable enough for there, we'd put you on a train to take you to a hospital in Baltimore or Washington or Philadelphia. Soon it comes time that they want to establish this. So 33 bids come in. It's $1.59 to start to disinter the Union dead. Because remember, this is a Union cemetery. They'll start after the first frost in October. They won't be done until March of 1864. And when they're done, they'll have 3,512 Union dead that are buried here. And soon there'll come time that they decide that they're going to have a sem uh, ceremony to dedicate this. And they're going to reach out to the best speaker in the land. And of course, the best speaker in the land is a man named Edward Everett. But before we get there, maybe we talk about a few more people who are buried here. Yeah, I think that's great. Thanks, Doug. And we're going to, uh, you know, introduce you to someone who needs no introduction, our friend Carol Reardon, who really has been so good about telling the actual, the soldier stories from this battle. And I, I applaud uh, Prof. Carol for this because she, she's, she's good at it and she tells stories that nobody else tells. So Carol, take it away. Hi everyone. As we begin to wind down this uh, 158th annual commemoration of the Battle of Gettysburg, I'll tell you something that I do uh, on occasions such as this, on Memorial Day, on Veterans Day, and some other times during the year. Uh, I come up here by myself and I sit down and I think and one of the things that I know a number of you are doing you're watching the movie Gettysburg some of you are breaking it down into July 1st, 2nd and 3rd segments and there's one conversation between Lee and Longstreet that always hits me very hard Lee will look at Longstreet and say General, we're in a, we're in a tough business uh, to be a good soldier you must love the army to be a good commander you must be willing to order the death of the thing that you love now think about that and how powerful a statement that is and how true it is. That even if you have the best plan and the righteous cause and the commitment of your troops, even if everything says you should win, not everybody's gonna to survive to celebrate the victory. And so we stand here among those uh, of the Union Army who were, who were buried up here and we think about uh, not just their personal sacrifices and the sacrifice of the family, but of the moral courage required of commanders to even give the orders that they gave on this field. That's a tough thing to think about. Sometimes we're too casual and cavalier in the way we uh, condemn a, a, a general for the decision that he made without thinking about how tough it was for him to make it in the first place. And so there's a lot to think about here and a lot to reflect upon here. And you caught up with me as I'm standing by the grave of a private in the 55th Ohio, Private Haskell Farr. Earlier today, what you did was to, uh, you, you heard Wayne Motts talking a whole lot about the fight uh, between the lines, between Cemetery Hill and the town, between Cemetery Hill and Seminary Ridge. Uh, Haskell Farr was one of the casualties in that fight. Uh, he was taken back behind the lines to a, a Union hospital, and he had a very bad leg wound, and nobody thought he would survive but he 
just wouldn't quit. He just wouldn't give up. If you take a look at the published rosters from the state of Ohio, and you find Haskell Farr's name in the 55th Ohio's roster, you'll see an interesting comment. Date of death, November 19th, 1863. There are books out there today that will still tell you that Haskell Farr was one of the last Union soldiers to die at the uh, Letterman uh, Hospital, that he was you know, the, the irony or the symmetry that comes with Lincoln's arrival and Farr's death. Problem is, it's not true to history. It's a wonderful story. But then our folks here from Ancestry and Fold 3 provide us with the kind of evidence we need to be able to go back and, and, and check on these stories and tell these stories the way they should be told. What we find out is that Haskell Farr put up a heck of a fight, but he died at the Letterman Hospital on the 3rd of October. Ruin's a perfectly good story, but I think we're doing right by him by telling you about when he lived and when he died. And we're, we're going toward that basic truth that we always want, we always want to achieve. So thank you for your service, Private Farr. We've, re we've remembered you today. In the same kind of fight, same fight down in the, uh, you know, off the, the uh, slopes of Cemetery Hill, there was another casualty, and I'm gonna bet that a lot of you know who he is. You've probably heard this story before, but it's still worthwhile to go and visit his grave. Already marked for us. Somebody's been here. Private George Nixon of the 73rd um, Ohio Infantry. He too was fighting on the, on the picket line or fi fighting on the skirmish line when he took a bullet through the stomach. Uh, he was screaming in pain. And a young musician, uh, Richard Enderlin from his regiment, actually put down his drum and ran out and grabbed Nixon and flung him over his shoulder and hauled him back here in order that he could be taken care of. Now, these are 11th Corps guys. The 11th Corps Hospital is in the George Spangler Farm that's just a half mile or so behind us here. Uh, but how do you get from being a wounded soldier up here down to that hospital down there? Well, every Corps has, a, has an ambulance train and the 11th Corps had a, a hundred different ambulances. They're probably stacked up down here and there would be an assistant surgeon from an 11th Corps regiment, or two or three of them, doing a basic triage. He can be helped, he can be saved. Nothing can be done from him, for him. It was necessary work, but it wasn't safe work. The only uh, Union medical officer to be killed or die of wounds here was uh, assistant surgeon William Moore of the 61st Ohio, another 11th Corps regiment, uh, who was mortally wounded on the mor morning of the 3rd by a piece of artillery shell. Uh, he called for help and called um, for assistant surgeons who were down at the George Spangler Farm to come up and get him, and they did, but he passed away down there. When we stand here in the Ohio plot, we have a number of soldiers who come from 11th Corps regiments uh, raised in Ohio. A lot of their wounded are going to end up down at the Spangler Farm. It's really kind of eerie to realize that they may have suffered their fatal wounds or even fallen dead within sight, within a few yards of where they're buried today. Of course, we know that George Nixon is also the great grandfather of future president of the United States, Richard Nixon. So from 18, July 1863, standing here, we can come up into the lifetimes of many of us standing here today. Uh, so the bridge to the past is not exactly a long one. It's actually kind of short, but there's more stories to tell as well. We're gonna just make a, a quick transition over from the Ohio uh, section over to the Massachusetts section. And we're switching from Culps Hill and Cemetery Hill down to Cemetery Ridge. It's July 3rd. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Boom, goes the artillery. The great artillery bombardment begins. And in the ranks of the 20th Massachusetts Infantry is a brand new second lieutenant. And by brand new, I mean within about a month and a half. His name was Sumner Payne. Sumner Payne was an 18 year old from Massachusetts. His mom and dad wanted uh, great things for him. And what they wanted him to do was to uh, go to school, get his education. Sumner Payne wanted to join the army. His older brothers were in, he wanted to join them too. His family basically said, do well in your first year at Harvard and we'll let you go with the army during the summer. 
How's that for what I did on my summer vacation? Well, Sumner Payne did well. By all accounts, he was a bit of a character, a bit of a prankster, the kind of a student that, as a professor myself, I would really give a hard time in the classroom, but absolutely find hysterical outside of it. He was that kind of a guy. But somehow when he put his uniform on, uh, everybody seemed to respect him, res despite his lack of experience and his, his young age. He had a way of getting his men to follow him. And here on, the, on July 3rd, over on uh, Cemetery Ridge, just south of the clump of trees, he's going to watch Pickett's Virginians advancing toward him. And he's going to say, isn't it glorious? when he'll be hit by one, one projectile. And as his men begin to move up toward the, the clump of trees, when uh, Pickett's men make their penetration, all he has to do is try to move his sword, except his arm has been hit, and he's, he's just trying to get his men to move. Just keep moving, keep moving. He'll be hit a second time, and he will be killed, in, and he will die of those wounds. Even though his family could certainly afford it, they had the means to remove the, take the remains back to Massachusetts. His family decided that uh, Payne should lie with the soldiers that he led, and so he's here. But you know, we just talked about Nixon basically being our connection to the present. Sumner Payne is our connection to the past. We're almost at the 4th of July. We're almost at the, birth, the birthday of our nation. Sumner Payne's great-grandfather was Robert Treat Payne, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So just between two graves, one here, one right over there. We can cover almost the whole American history. We have the bridge right here. It's kind of cool. One more I want to show you. It's basically somebody who shouldn't even be here. Private J.L. Johnson. It says Company K, Regiment 11. There is an 11th Massachusetts here. But if you go and check the roster, you can't find a private J.L. Johnson in the 11th Mississippi, or yeah, just gave it away, um, <laughs> the 11th Massachusetts that uh, fell here. Now, this is a paperwork glitch. This is Private John L. Johnson of the 11th Mississippi. Uh, he was, the 11th Mississippi was in Robert, was in um, Davis's brigade, um, jo yeah, Joseph Davis's brigade. They, these were the soldiers that fought at the, uh, Railroad cut, opened the battle, but the 11th Mississippi had not been with them. They held back, they were guarding trains. The only part of the Gettysburg action they get involved with is Pickett's Charge. Uh, Johnson was a student, an 18-year-old student, and he enlisted in 1862, and he probably uh, fell fairly close to the wall because he was taken to a Union hospital to be cared for. Uh, when he finally passed away, somewhere along the line, there was a transcription error. error. And instead of Company K, 11th Mississippi, he was listed as Company K, 11th Massachusetts. M-I-S-S -S became M-A-S-S. -S. And so we have a Confederate, Private John Johnson, buried here in the, Massa in the Massachusetts section of the National Cemetery. There are a few other Confederates who have snuck in here as well, but each one of them has a story. And in fact, that's probably one of the things that we've tried to impress upon you uh, during our entire commemoration uh, it, during the 158th uh, anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Every soldier who's, who fought here has a story to tell, and it's our obligation to find as many of them as we possibly can. Carol, you, you, you get it better than I do, and I set all this stuff up with Chris White's help. So thank you so much for everything. You're an you're, you know, absolute master of this subject, so thank you very much. And I would just say there's more surprises. The more you look, the more you will find. Uh, you know, uh, Carol just told you, I told you this was a Union cemetery, and yet there are some Confederate soldiers here. Um, I could tell you a story about a soldier who came here and saw his own uh, headstone, you know, uh, here in the cemetery, uh, only to find that there was another administrative mistake, and that was no longer the case. We could truly do a whole series just on the Soldiers National Cemetery, and I don't think it would be five or ten videos. I think it would be something like 40 or 50, and we still wouldn't be done because there's 3,512 stories here. Now, 
This cemetery is best known because of, of course, the Gettysburg Address. I think it's one of the things that makes Gettysburg, uh, you know, the, the greatest battlefield is because it's near population centers. It was the first Civil War battlefield to be preserved. Um, it is, uh, you know, the largest, uh, the costliest battle of the Civil War and also the Gettysburg Address adding to its fame. So let's bring it up there, Doug. Okay. Well, why don't we walk up this way? Because when we talk about when it finally comes time to dedicate this, uh, this cemetery, not all of this is here. That great monument that we see up in the center of this now, it was always designed to be there, but in 1863, that's a giant flagpole. And actually, maybe the question that we should just head off on the pass, if this is a Union cemetery, then where are the Confederates? Well, it has everything to do with that, that monument up there. That monument is cornerstones dedicated on July 1st, July 4th, 1865. This, the whole thing will be dedicated on July 1st, 1869. The keynote speaker that day is none other than Major General George Gordon Meade, who will rival anybody for the shortest speech ever made in this cemetery. And it will be George Gordon Meade who sits there and he thanks everybody for coming, and he thanks Governor John White Geary. And then the last thing he does is says it's always proper usage to account for the burial, decent and respectful burial of the dead even the dead of our enemies. It's George Gordon Meade who stands here in 1869 and says, what about them? What about the Confederates that are here? And this opens the door for two years for women's groups largely to come up from the South between 1870 and 1872. And by the time they're done, they're gonna disinter 3,300 Confederate dead, take them back to Confederate uh, cemeteries in Richmond, Charleston, Durham, and Savannah. So that brings us up at least to how we get the Confederates out of here. Now let's talk about the dedication of this. They reach out to the, the best speaker in the land to try and dedicate this cemetery. And the best speaker in the land is this man. It's Edward Everett. He's the best speaker in the land. Former Congressman, former Senator, former Secretary of State, former Ambassador to England, former Governor of Massachusetts, former President of Harvard. He once went around the United States and gave 124 talks about George Washington and dedicated every dime he made to the first person to help preservate, preserve Mount Vernon. He's the best speaker in the land. And so what they do is they offer, would you do give the keynote address? And he says, yes, I will. And they open up a calendar and they say, how about the 23rd of October? And he goes, I couldn't possibly be ready. And they flip the calendar. How about the 19th of November? He goes, I can do that. And that sets the date. And he's really the first historian of the Battle of Gettysburg. He will interview officers. He'll read official records and he'll actually visit the battlefields. And then he would write up his remarks. Now, about two weeks prior to them having this ceremony, they're going to reach out to the president because there are going to be 18 governors here and we are approaching an election year. And it falls to that same poor attorney whose instructions are, you can invite the president, but tell him we already have a keynote speaker. So maybe a few appropriate remarks. And that's dutifully what he puts in the invitation. And of course, Abraham Lincoln accepts. Secretary of State Seward says, we'll just go up the day of, and Lincoln says, no, no, I know how those trains work. We're gonna go up the day prior. They'll arrive downtown at the train station on the 18th of November. In fact, they'll stay at the David Wills house with 23 other people down on the town square. In fact, even Edward Everett is given a roommate. He doesn't want a roommate, so he goes to bed early and he locks the door. He locks out Governor Curtin. Governor Curtin will end up sleeping on a chair in the lobby of one of the local hotels with 15,000 other people who have come to see the dedication of this cemetery. Now, the way this is supposed to work is it's supposed to start with a parade starting at 10 o'clock downtown. Now, everybody talks about how festive this began, but with each step as they take towards this cemetery, it becomes more and more solemn until they arrive here. And what's here? Again, get rid of the large monument. That's not here. That's a giant flagpole in 1863. Get rid of the fence around the outside. That's not here. In fact, that's around Lafayette Park at this point and just across from the White House. And just on the other side of where we see that would be the platform, the podium, from which all the speakers would, would go ahead and give their remarks. And of course, first it's Edward Everett's turn. Now Everett would get up and he would flip through all his pages and everybody would ooh and ah because they knew he had memorized his remarks. And he would set his remarks down on a little podium and then he would summon his inner Pericles and he would start. And he would compare the United States to Greece and to Rome. And as he talked about the battlefield, he would say out by the railroad cut and down by Little Round Top. And occasionally he would pause and look back at his notes as if he might go over to take a peek. And as he walked over, he would continue on and the crowd would cheer and he would speak for an hour and 57 minutes. And I know you're sitting out there going, oh my gosh, how could anybody take that? But my guess is now that COVID is largely passed and you're all vaccinated, you guys are gonna go to a summer blockbuster for two hours and 20 minutes this summer. And an era before movies, TV and radio, Edward Everett was spectacular. And all you have to do is read anything from Lincoln's executive secretaries, because they said Edward Everett Everett was wonderful and Lincoln did like a little better than he normally does. That was kind of their assessment for the day. And after Everett would speak, the crowd would cheer 
And then he would sit down, a group of men would get up and they would sing a hymn. And then Abraham Lincoln would rise, walk forward, and he would deliver his Gettysburg Address. 10 sentences, 272 words, in just over two minutes. And you already know. So here's what I think he tries to do. I think he tries to take three roles in three times. As a US citizen, he goes back in time, four score and seven years ago, not to that compromised constitution for which we wrote in slavery, not under the word slavery, but persons of labor and persons of service, that 75 years later that fuse ignites into our American Civil War. But to our Declaration of Independence, and he reminds us of our values, all men are created equal, all people are created equal. As the commander-in-chief, he's here, he's present, and he can see the great cost, and he says it's altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, that we should recognize those that gave the last full measure of their devotion. And then as the United States president, he steps into the future and asks for increased resolve that these men should not have died in vain. And then he does something truly remarkable. As he stands on this physical high ground, he puts the nation on the moral high ground for all the world to see the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And you should ask yourself, how does Abraham Lincoln make time travel happen in just over two minutes? And I would argue, we've been talking for days about the power of this place. He uses the word here nine times. From here, you can look back and see where we've been. From here, you can take stock of where we are. And from here, you can spring into the future. And because he uses 15 collective pronouns, we, us, and our, because he uses language like the great task remaining and the unfinished work, his words still speak to us today. And you go, I don't know. That, was, that seems like a long time ago. Edward Everett would write him two weeks later and said, I should flatter myself if I came near the central idea of this occasion in two hours, as you did in two minutes. Moreover, I would argue here's two ways we still use Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. We know our history, 13 colonies keep it together roughly long enough not to lose to the British, and then we're Articles of Confederation and Federalists and Anti-Federalists and we're a mess. And Lincoln says, nope, that's not how it was. He said, we were one nation conceived in liberty before it all began. And as Americans, that's the way we start looking at our American Revolution. The other way we should think about it is we were talking earlier about how you develop strategy. And it often begins with enduring values and beliefs and that drives our interests and interest drives policy and policy drives strategy. But it begins with enduring values and beliefs. And as Americans, we should ask ourselves, where do we get those enduring values and beliefs? And I would argue a precious few documents. Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, Lincoln's second inaugural, his Gettysburg Address, if you really want to press me, I'll give you FDR's Four Freedoms and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, and it's the sum total of who we are as a people. And I can hear you. You're going, I don't know. I've been watching the news recently, and this doesn't seem like that's who we are. That's a fair critique. If it isn't who we are, I would argue it is who we aspire to be. Then Lincoln would end by telling a little lie. He would say, people, a little note nor long remember what we did here, but they can never forget what they... You can never forget what I said here, but they can never forget what they did here. Now, here's the thing. I've taken people from all around the world around this battlefield, and they don't have a clue what they did here until you bring them here. And then they know every word that Lincoln uttered. This idea of government of, by, and for the people, if it doesn't exist here, it doesn't exist anywhere. When Lincoln talks a great about the great task remaining and the unfinished work, that's what he's talking about. Gang, we are stewards of this democracy in our time, no less so than Sumner Payne's grandfather, no less so than Sumner Payne here, no less so than President Nixon as his great-grandfather served on this battlefield. We are all tied in one large connection to this democracy and it's incredibly fragile. And so that great task remaining is all of our work. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much for the 158th anniversary here at Gettysburg and for spending time with the American Battlefield Trust. Keep up the good work, gang. We're all stewards of this precious democracy.